if we go back <clears throat> to the origins of the Zionist immigration in the late 19th century, early 20th century, one could define the relationship between the Arabs of the land who were not yet self-identified as Palestinians with the new Jewish immigrants as a struggle between narrative and presence. And I'll explain what I mean. One side had the clear advantage of narrative, and the other side had the clear advantage of presence. Now, just to give you some idea of the demography here, before I unpack this narrative and presence uh, dichotomy, there were less than a million people living in the land of Israel slash Palestine in the late 19th century. A majority were Muslim Arabs, a minority Christian Arabs, and Jews. In Jerusalem, the Jews were a clear majority. The Jews, in fact, were a majority even before the Zionists began moving in the late 19th century. By the mid-19th century, there was a clear Jewish majority in Jerusalem. Nevertheless, though we're speaking about very small populations, we're still really looking at the advantage of presence, presence, physical presence on the land, belonging to the Arab side. On the Jewish side, there was the clear advantage of narrative. And by narrative, I mean a consistent story linking the Jewish people to the land of Israel for 3,500 years. The Palestinians who were not yet self-identified as Palestinians did not have a clear unified narrative linking them to this land. There was a deep sense of family connection, of tribal connection. There was a sense of belonging to the greater Arab world, to the Muslim world. But the notion of a distinct Palestinian identity emerges only later. And what happens in this conflict between the Jews and the Arabs is that the more the conflict intensifies through the 1920s, 30s, 40s, the more each side learns to compensate for what it is lacking. It looks at the other side and it, and it decides, I need, I need to learn from what the other side has. So the way that worked, for example, with the Palestinians is first of all, they began to define themselves as a distinct national identity, separate from the rest of the Arab world and the Muslim world, a distinct identity within the broader Arab and Muslim worlds. And they learned this clearly from the Zionist movement. You know, there was, there was an old Israeli joke which wasn't very funny even then, and less so now, uh, which says that Zionism was the most successful national liberation movement because it created two national movements. And whether, however one wants to take the, the consequences of that, that is simply the way history unfolded. The Palestinians, the Arabs of the land, were paying very close attention to the creation of national institutions, the Jewish agency, the Jewish National Fund. And they be began creating parallel national institutions that mimicked the increasingly successful Zionist infrastructure to the extent where they even borrowed, openly borrowed, the very names of these institutions and simply substituted their own names. And on our side, we began to compensate for the lack of a significant Jewish presence in the land through Aliyah, through massive, increasingly large-scale immigration. And if you look at some of the early photographs of the, the, the Zionist pioneers in the early 20th century, you'll see young Jews from Eastern Europe wearing kafiyas, riding bareback, mimicking the Bedouin. 
And of course, the food of, of the Arabs of the land, Lebanon and hummus, this became integrated into, into the emerging Israeli culture, not yet Israel, the, what we call the Yishuv, the state before the state on the way. And so we were mimicking them as well. We were trying to compensate for our lack of presence, and they were trying to compensate for their lack of narrative. If one looks at the situation today, fast forward from the end of the 19th century to the beginning of the 21st century, what we see is that this struggle, the struggle for the land, successfully created two national movements. Each of these movements, for better or for worse, learning from the other, and succeeding in compensating for what each of them had lacked. Now, if I had to define the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, or the state of Israel versus the Arab and much of the Muslim world, I would call it a conflict over the right to define oneself as a legitimate people with the right to self-determination. Now, each side at different stages denied the legitimacy of the other's national identity. And each side, I would argue, did so not entirely out of ill will, although there was plenty of that to go around, but more from a sense of misperception based on each side's experience of the other. So, for example, the Arab world said to us, we know who you are, we know the Jews, because you have lived as a minority under Islam for centuries. You are a religious minority. We will accept you as a religious minority under Islam, but you have no right to define yourselves as a people. You've reinvented yourselves in the, 19th, in the late 19th century under the influence of Western nationalism as a people, as a nation, and now you're demanding the right to national sovereignty. Religions don't have sovereignty. Religions are not a people. You are a religion. Now, from their perspective, that was, to some extent, an understandable misperception. And it was a misperception in the way that majorities never really understand who their minorities are or how their minorities fully perceive themselves. If you had asked any Jew living in the Arab world throughout the centuries of dispersion, who are you? Who are the Jews? The answer would have been very simple. We are part of the people of Israel. We have been exiled from our land. One day, God is going to return us home. That would have been the normative Jewish response anywhere in the diaspora, from Ethiopia to Poland to, to Morocco. And so when the Arab world insisted, and to this day continues to insist, that we are not a nation, we are not a people, what they are saying is they know who we are better than we know ourselves. They have the right to define who we are more than we have the right to define who we are. That's what the argument today is between Israel and the Arab world. And I, am in, I, I meet with, with many Palestinians, I meet with, with Muslims, and you hear this over and over again. We have nothing against Jews. It's the Zionists. It's when you start to define yourselves as a nation. And, or for example, I'll be in an interfaith, in an interfaith encounter, and, and a Muslim will say to me, you know what, let's leave politics, let's not talk about Israel. Let's leave politics outside. And I'll say, for me as a Jew, certainly as a religious Jew, I can't leave Israel outside of my identity. Israel is an essential part of who I am. It's not political. And so the continuing inability of the Arab world in virtually across the board, moderates, extremists, to accept the legitimacy 
of Jewish national identity, to accept us as a people, to accept the fact that we have the right to define ourselves as a people, I would define this today as the essential stumbling block to peace. In one word, what is the stumbling block to peace? The Arab world's refusal to accept the legitimacy of the Jews as a people and a nation rather than as a religion. Now, on our side, <clears throat> we had similar blinders toward the Palestinians for many years. And here again, I would argue that the notion that was prevalent in Israel, that the Palestinians are not a real people, was an understandable misperception. And the reason I say it was understandable is because when the Zionists began coming back, the Arabs whom they encountered initially didn't define themselves as Palestinians. They were not a self-identified nation. Who created them? Who made them a Palestinian people? We did. Zionism did. The, what they learned from us, and as they began to resist our return, they began to coalesce a national identity so that we really are the reluctant uh, parents of uh, Palestinian nationalism. Now, Golda Meir, in uh, the early 1970s, famously or infamously said that there is no such thing as a Palestinian people, and she said that uh, when she came to the land of Israel, it was the Jews who were called Palestinians by the British, the Jerusalem Post was called the Palestine Post. Uh, the Zionist banks were, were Palestine banks. Uh, the, um, the passports that Jews were issued by the British were to Palestinians. The Arabs in those years were actually not Palestinians. It was the Jews who were the Palestinians. Now, Golda was right for the 1920s and the 1930s. By the 1970s, it was already clear or it should have been, that the Palestinians are now a distinct people with a, an emerging narrative. The attitudes in Israel began to change significantly during the period that we call the First Intifada of the late 1980s. And the First Intifada was the time when Growing numbers of young Palestinians went to prison, throwing rocks at Israeli soldiers. There was, there was a massive uprising. And that was the moment when a majority of Israelis began to come to terms with a distinct Palestinian national identity. And it's interesting, I often find that when I speak to American Jewish audiences, I have a harder time using the word Palestinians than I would to a right-wing Israeli audience. Because in Israel today, whether people oppose or support a two-state solution, there's no real argument anymore about whether the Palestinians are a people. Here, what I'll hear over and over again, among many American Jews, is the Palestinians are an invented people. And my response is, that's right. They are an invented people, but the definition of peoplehood is a group of random people who one day decide to invent themselves as a people. Every people is born at a certain point. Every people has its trajectory. The Palestinian trajectory came to its own in its fullness during the First Intifada. And that was the, really the moment when even people like Arik Sharon began speaking about the Palestinians. So that today, when you listen to Israeli discourse, Netanyahu speaks about a two-state solution. He speaks about the Palestinian people. It is not an issue for serious debate except on the far, far right of Israeli politics. And I find a, a, a conceptual gap again, between the discourse among Israelis and much of the discourse among pro-Israel American Jews. And I don't think it enhances the credibility of those who are defending Israel to deny what even in Israel 
for even for much of the Israeli right has become a given, which is we are confronting a people, they are functioning as a people, they're sacrificing as a people, they are enemies as it happens, but nevertheless, that is who we are facing. Now, let's look at some of the Palestinian or let's more broadly Arab claims against Zionism. And let's try to unpack some of those. First, I'd like to briefly go back to this notion of the Jews as being a religion and not a people, because again, I think this is crucial for the following reason. Even though for many years there was a certain symmetry in mutual denial between the Israelis and the Palestinians as far as the other not being a real people, today, as, I've, as I just indicated, the overwhelming majority of Israelis don't deny the fact that the Palestinians are a people. We can argue about what to do with that, what to do about that. Can we live with a Palestinian state? That's a separate question. The issue of are the Palestinians a people or not has been resolved in Israeli, in Israeli discourse. It has not at all been resolved in the Arab world. In the Arab world today, it is still normative to deny the notion of the existence of a Jewish people. We are not a people in the Arab world. We are a pretend people. We are a religion. And what I often try to explain to Muslims is that it's true that we speak about the three monotheistic faiths, but Judaism works differently in a very crucial way. And that is, in Islam and in Christianity, if you stop believing in the basic principles of the faith, you're no longer a Muslim or a Christian. You're simply out. In Judaism, as we all know, one can be an atheist, uh, one can barbecue on Yom Kippur, and it's not, I'm not just inventing that metaphor, that actually, that's what many Israelis do on Yom Kippur. One can be a complete denier of Jewish dogma and Jewish practice, and still be a Jew in reasonably good standing, depending who you ask, but nevertheless, no one, not the most ultra-Orthodox rabbi, will write you out of the Jewish people for not observing or not believing in God, if you are part of the Jewish people. And the reason for that is because we are a people, because the foundation of Jewish identity is peoplehood. In fact, peoplehood is a religious category in Judaism. So this is a concept that is virtually inexplicable for the Muslim world, and this is the primary stumbling block. This is not just an abstract theological principle. This, today, is the main stumbling block for why we don't have peace, because they don't see us as a legitimate people, as a nation, as a real nation. The other argument that one often hears from the Muslim world is that the Jews came as colonialists. We came with, we were the latest wave of Western colonialism. And uh, the more clever, the more sophisticated Arab spokespeople will note that we called that the Zionist institutions bore colonial names. There was the Zionist Colonial Bank. There were, there, there were the, colon we, we used the colonial language. And here I think we need to step back for a moment and look at a crucial moment in Zionist history. In 1902, Theodor Herzl, the founder of, of, of political Zionism, was offered a territory by the British in Africa. He was offered what is today Uganda as a refuge for the Jews of Eastern Europe who needed a place to, to escape from. 
And Herzl, at this point, was desperate. There were pogroms in Russia, Jews were in physical danger. Herzl had a deep intuition that the Jews of Europe were sitting on a volcano. And the British come along with this colonial offer. And Herzl comes to the Zionist Congress and he says, let's take this offer. He says, I know it's not what we dreamed of. We dreamed of the land of Israel, but we need a safe refuge. And the opposition at the Zionist Congress was led by the delegates from Eastern Europe, which is to say the very Jews whom Herzl hoped to save were those who opposed the Uganda plan because for them there could be no place to go except the land of Israel. Now, this is really, I find, one of the most moving moments in Zionist history because there's a real existential dilemma here. There are hundreds of thousands, eventually millions of Jews on the move looking for a safe refuge. The British are offering a territory in Africa, and Herzl is, is, is tempted. And when the Uganda plan is rejected by the very Jews whom Herzl had intended the plan to save, that is the critical moment in the history of Zionism, when the Zionists define themselves not as a colonialist movement, but as a movement of repatriation, of return to one's homeland. Had the Zionists accepted Herzl's offer, from my point of view, it would have been entirely understandable. Nevertheless, Zionism at that moment would have crossed the line and really become a colonialist movement. It would have been the most tragic colonialist movement. It would have been a colonialist movement whose intention was not to plunder another people's land, but to seek safety. Nevertheless, if we would have entered into a pact with the British over Uganda, that would have been the moment that would have defined Zionism as colonialism. When Zionism said no to Uganda, it was, it was establishing the principle that even at the risk of existential threat, we will opt for the land of Israel. So that became the moment of Zionism making a clear choice. And you know, if I had to define Zionism, I would say very simply, political Zionism was the meeting point between need and longing. Need, existential need, a place for safety, and that was one very strong impetus of Zionism, but no less significant was thousands of years of Jewish longing to return to our ancestral home. And so Zionism was the meeting point of need and longing, and in the Uganda crisis, Zionism chose longing over need, a crucial moment in determining who we are, so that today when I hear Zionism defined as colonialism, it frankly drives me mad. And the irony here is that the more successful Israel becomes in re-indigenizing ourselves, and I don't know if I've made that word up, but it's a very useful word, because we are the only people in history that I can think of, the only indigenous people that ever needed to re-indigenize itself. Zionism is the movement of the re-indigenization of the Jewish people. The more that we succeed in re-indigenizing ourselves, we have now produced in Israel three, four, five generations of native-born re-indigenized Israelis. The more we re-indigenize ourselves, the more the world or large parts of the world question the legitimacy of our indigenousness. There were three successive phases in land acquisition on the part first of the Zionist movement and then of the state of Israel. The first stage of land acquisition begins in 1882 with the Zionist, the beginning of the Zionist return and it ends in 1948. From, from 1882 to 1948, 
Zionist land acquisition happens only in one way, and that is by buying land. You bought land from landlords, from absentee landlords, whoever had a deed to land that was willing, an Arab landowner, and was willing to sell to Zionists, that was how land acquisition happened, which is to say entirely legally. The next phase of land acquisition happens in 1948. It happens as a result of the War of Independence. After Israel had, of course, accepted UN partition, the Arab world rejects UN partition, invades Israel, tries to destroy Israel, and we win. And in the process of winning, what happens when an army is victorious is it conquers land. So the 1947 UN partition borders expand to the 1949 post-war borders, which is what Israel emerged from, a war of self-defense. The notion of Israel stealing land really needs to be, to be looked at very carefully because we acquired land until 1948 through purchase, and then we acquired land on two occasions through, through wars of self-defense. The next accusation against Israel is expulsion of the Palestinians in 1948. And we now know that the earlier narratives which we told ourselves in the earlier Zionist histories after 1948 were incomplete. We told ourselves that the Palestinians fled, and we now know that, yes, many did flee, many were expelled, and some were allowed to remain in their homes. Now, when you speak to Israelis who come from Arab countries, and you tell them, you know, on American campuses, we're, we're being accused of expelling the Palestinians in 1948, the response is incredulity. Because what happened as a result of the 1948 war were two refugee populations. There was a Palestinian refugee crisis that emerged, and there was a Jewish refugee crisis in which ancient Jewish diasporas, in some case, as in the case of Iraq, for example, went back 2,500 years. 2,500 year Jewish, Jewish community in Iraq was destroyed in one month in 1951 when the entire Jewish community of Iraq fled to Israel. So what happened in effect as a result of the 1948 war was a population exchange. India, Pakistan, think of uh, uh, the, the Sudeten Germans after World War II uh, being expelled from, from uh, Czechoslovakia. Millions, tens of millions, at this point probably hundreds of millions of refugees from the 20th century. The only refugee problem that remains are the Palestinians, because that is the refugee problem that has been politicized and enshrined in, in the UN. So the notion of Israeli guilt for land acquisition, the notion of Israeli guilt for the Palestinian refugee problem, I think needs to be placed very much in its context. The last point that I'll bring up before we'll open for a conversation is the question of, um, of peace initiatives. Who is at fault for the absence of peace? One can go back to the 1936 Peel Commission report and see the beginning of a pattern where the mainstream Zionist movement says yes to a, a proposal for partition. The Arab world says no. 1947, of course, and then 2000. I think that the most significant date for understanding where we are today is the year 2000. Not Camp David. And here I would make a clear distinction between two proposals that were made for a Palestinian state, both of which were rejected by the Palestinian leadership, one at Camp David in July 2000, the other, the Clinton proposals of December 2000. Now, at Camp David in 2000, um, 
the, um, which was presided over by, uh, by President Clinton. The, the, for the first time, Prime Minister Ehud Barak put an Israeli proposal on the table, two-state solution, redividing Jerusalem, and Arafat walked away from the table. The problem with Camp David is that there are two, there are two narratives. The Palestinians claim that we never really offered what we said we offered. We insist that we did. President Clinton actually backed us up. But the Palestinian uh, propaganda machine post-2000 was very successful in blurring the Israeli offer for a two-state solution at Camp David. What I think is more significant is the Israeli acceptance in December 2000 of, the, of what became known as the Clinton proposals. Now, the Clinton proposals left no room for ambiguity. President Clinton, who had spent more time trying to solve the Palestinian problem than any other world leader, placed all of his prestige on a plan. He put a plan on the table, and he told the Israelis and the Palestinians, take it or leave it. That plan would have given the Palestinians the equivalent of 100% of the territory with a land swap to include, to allow Israel to hold on to, to what we call settlement blocks. Uh, it would have redivided uh, Jerusalem. Temple Mount goes to the Palestinians, the wall to us. Jewish neighborhoods in Jerusalem go to Israel, Palestinian neighborhoods to, to Palestinian state. We said yes, and the Palestinian leadership said no, because Clinton, the one stipulation, the one demand that Clinton made on the Palestinian leadership in return for Israel's withdrawal to the equivalent of the 67 lines was that the Palestinians would have to accept that refugee return, what they call right of return, will be confined to a Palestinian state. There will be no refugee return to the state of Israel because that is clearly undermining the whole idea of a two-state solution, which is you have two states, each responsible for its own diaspora. Any Jews who want to go home go to the state of Israel. Any Palestinians who want to go home go to the state of Palestine. When the Palestinian leadership rejected the Clinton proposals because of the right of return, that was a clear message to the Israeli public that this conflict was never about the 67 occupation, but the 1948 occupation, which is to say the existence of the state of Israel. For the Palestinian leadership, for the Arab world, it's all one occupation. And so the inability, the refusal of the Palestinian leadership to accept a contraction of the right of return into a Palestinian state and insistence on right of return to the state of Israel meant that the Palestinian leadership continued, and I would argue continues to this day, to reject the long-term viability of a Jewish state in any borders. And as Don Meridor once put it, Don Meridor, former Likud uh, leader who was at Camp David with Ehud Barak, uh, he once said that the problem is not a Palestinian state because if that was the problem, we would have solved it. The problem is a Jewish state. So let's open for conversation. Uh, when do you think we went from being a people, or I'm sorry, from being a religion to a people? Oh, I think we were a people before we were a religion. I think that um, we, were, we were a people or a proximity of a people uh, before we reached Mount Sinai. We, the, the, the exodus happened to a people, but we were not yet a clearly defined religion. It was at Sinai, if one wants to accept the tradition, it was at Sinai that the people was imprinted with a particular religious identity. But we, we were definitely some an approximation of a people before we were a religion. Uh, my question to you is, today, what would a two-state solution really look like? I mean, I understand the borders, but we're dealing with standing armies, ambassadors, 
um, economy, self-generating water, electricity, and what did a two-state solution look like in the Clinton plan? Well, I, um, I'm, I'll answer the second question about the Clinton plan, and I'm going to answer your first question in a slightly different way. Because what, I'm, what I would like to really focus on in this session is the conceptual issues. So let's, let's look at what a Palestinian, a two-state solution would look like conceptually, rather than looking, looking at water and borders and all of those issues. You'll get that at lots of other APAC sessions. This is and, really- And diplomacy and military. Yeah, all of that I'm going to sidestep and, and I'm going to, to instead answer a question that you didn't exactly ask, but you're giving me the opportunity to. And that is, what would a, what is the conceptual basis of a two-state solution? And I would argue the following. The tragedy of this conflict is that you have two peoples who each from their own narrative can make a compelling claim for why the totality of the land between the river and the sea belongs to them. For me, the West Bank is not the West Bank. It's Judea and Samaria. Hebron is more precious to me than Tel Aviv. I love Tel Aviv. I have two kids living in Tel Aviv. But it is a city that is built on sand. It's a baby city. It has no roots. Hebron is the oldest continuous Jewish city in the world. 4,000 years of Jewish history. There is a medieval Jewish cemetery in Hebron. There are ancient ruins in Hebron to say nothing of the, the tomb of the patriarchs and matriarchs. So for me, when I'm in Hebron, I feel this is home. The problem is that a Palestinian can make a claim from, from their point of view that Haifa belongs to them. When I speak to Palestinians and they tell me that Haifa belongs to them, my response is, you're right. Haifa does belong to you. The problem is that Hebron belongs to me. And so if Haifa belongs to you and Hebron belongs to me, we have one of two choices. We can either continue another 100 years of war and let's see who wins. Maybe you'll win because you're the majority in the region and I'm, I'm, I'm the only non-Arab, non-Muslim state. Maybe after the next two or three wars, young Israelis will finally get sick of it all and, and move to Australia. Maybe, maybe. Or maybe we'll win because we have the only viable society in the Middle East. We have the only successful country today in the Middle East. So maybe we'll wait you out and maybe you'll end up with another Nakba. Maybe you'll end up uh, if, you can t if you keep this going for another, another 20, 30, 50 years, maybe the rest of you will end up in Jordan. I said, that's one, that's one possibility, and it's a real possibility. The other possibility is to go back to the only solution that was ever on the table, which is partition. Now, partition is not a fair solution. It is not just. Partition is an act of injustice inflicted on two peoples, each of whom believes that the whole land belongs to them. For me to lose Hebron will be like an amputation. It is an act of profound injustice, as I understand it, to Jewish history. But if I'm going to demand that the Palestinians give up their claim to Haifa, and if we're going to try to reach an agreement, the, the deal is Haifa for Hebron. And both sides will, will, will experience that deal as an act of profound historic injustice. The way that I envision a peace agreement is not with a celebratory signing on the White House lawn with balloons. I see it as a day of mourning for the Jewish people, that we have lost Judea and Samaria. The next day we can celebrate the peace, but not before we mourn losing what belongs. It belongs to us. Now I'll take it a step further, which is that if we, if we approach the negotiations with the Palestinians by saying, as the Israeli left does, that we're occupiers in the territories, it doesn't belong to us, you've lost. You, the only way you can negotiate an agreement with the Palestinians 
is if you come to them and you say, you say all of this belongs to you, I accept that. That's how you see it. And I'm not going to get all upset about the maps that only show Palestine, because my maps only show Israel. When I look at, at Judea and Samaria, I don't see Palestine, I see Israel. I see the land of Israel. Now, it all belongs to me, and you say it all belongs to you, what are we going to do about it? Let's make a deal that we're both not going to like. That's the way you're going to reach a deal in the Middle East. When the Israeli left comes to the Palestinians, you know, with the, with the guilt, and says, yeah, you know, we're occupiers, it doesn't, it's, it's not ours. The other side is saying it's all theirs. And we're coming to them and saying, well, it's half ours. You don't reach an agreement that way. And so that's why I believe that, that the side that has the best chance, the political camp that has the best chance for reaching an agreement is that political camp which believes the land all belongs to us but is ready for pragmatic reasons to try to reach a peace agreement with the other side and to sacrifice part of what belongs to us. That for me is a conceptual basis for peace and maybe I would put it in the following way. The trade-off has to be, I give up my claim to greater Israel and you give up your claim to greater Palestine because the problem is greater Israel and greater Palestine are the same place and something has to give. Now, it's not the question you asked, but thank you for the question anyway. Nation versus state. I've always taught the idea that the Jewish nation has existed in Egypt. You know, this, I, it's the people versus the concept of the state. Have the, has, there was no Palestinian people uh, that they call themselves. I, I'm not, they, they didn't start calling themselves a people, I think, till the 1930s. But there's a, there's a, these people living, these, these, the Arabs living in the colony, in the British colony, in the, the Ottoman Empire, they did have an identity. Oh, very they, much so. They, they were was Arabs. It, was they were it a Muslims. tribal identity? They were, they were Arabs and Muslims. Okay. But the, the, the Arabs called uh, Palestine Lower Syria. That was, the, uh, that was how the land was known in those, in those times, in the, in the Arab world. Palestine was Roman. Palestine was a Roman name, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so it's, 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 you know, it's interesting but at this point, largely irrelevant. Because they've, thanks to us, they have emerged as a nation. Right, okay. A, a nation without a state. A nation without a state. Okay. Right. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for such a concise yet comprehensive uh, description of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Thank you. And my question is, Looking at Israel today, what role do uh, the Arab nation, the Arab countries surrounding Israel, have, distinct from the Palestinians, in influencing the Palestinian-Israeli peace process? Well, you know, Netanyahu's hope, and he said this, is that about we'll reach a two-state solution not through the Palestinians but through the Arab world because the Palestinian leadership is either unable or unwilling to make the necessary compromises on right of return. And, and his hope is that parts of the Arab world will force the Palestinian leadership to, um, to reach an agreement with us. You know, all I can say is inshallah, but it's, it's really, it's, it's so, it's, it's very far-fetched at this point. I don't think we are anywhere near an agreement. Uh, Michael Oren had a very important piece in the Wall Street Journal last week. I really urge all of you to, to look it up. It was called, uh, two, I think it's called a two-state situation. And he says that we can't negotiate an agreement with the Palestinian leadership for a two-state solution because the Palestinian leadership doesn't want to reach a solution with us in which they have to genuinely make their peace with the Jewish state. 
So he said, what we need to do is look at the facts on the ground, and we have a de facto Palestinian state that already exists in, in much of the West Bank, and we need to, without any sign ceremonies, without any peace process, which is always, at least for the foreseeable future, going to fail, let's work with what exists on the ground and let's be practical about it. And I think it's a very important idea, the notion of a two-state situation as opposed to a two-state solution. I was just wondering, if you value the land as historically ours, why do you feel like you should give it up for peace? Did you all hear the question? If you value the land as being ours, why do I believe it should be given up for peace? Because it's not only for peace, and, and it may not even in the end be for peace. It may be to save Israel demographically from a Palestinian majority. That may, that may be the incentive for an Israeli withdrawal. You know, in, uh, in life we have to make decisions. There are hierarchies of values. And the question is, is holding the complete land of Israel, which is a value for me, it's a, it's a deep value for me, but is that the ultimate value? Is, is losing part of the land of Israel, and that's how I see it, I see it as losing part of what belongs to me, and keeping a Jewish majority and a democratic state in Israel, uh, is, is that a trade-off that's worth considering? And if we really could get peace, would that be worth doing? From where I'm sitting, both of those are very strong incentives for giving up part of what belongs to me. Um, forgive me for my lack of historical knowledge, but um, why is it that the Jewish people can um, recognize the Palestinians as a people, but not as a state? Is that due to Palestine's lack of compromise, or are there other reasons behind that? Well, the, the, um, Israel has recognized the Palestinians as a people. We did that in 1993 with Oslo, and every, every success of Israeli government, left, right, or center, has affirmed that. And we've been trying to negotiate a Palestinian state. The problem is that, that every time we sit down to negotiate a, a Palestinian state, the other side's demands uh, are, um, are, are, are such that, that we would not be able to survive under those conditions. If we gave in to the Palestinian demand that the descendants of refugees from 1948 would be allowed to move to the state of Israel, we would eventually lose the Jewish majority and Israel wouldn't be Israel anymore. So that in effect, what the Palestinian leadership is telling me is we accept a two-state solution, but only on condition that it will eventually become a one state. So it's really a two-state solution as an interim agreement on the way to destroying Israel and creating greater Palestine. And that, of course, is, is unacceptable. You've hit on these points a couple of times that the Palestinians really just want all of Israel. They don't want the two-state solution. Not all of them, but some of them. Don't you feel like there has to be an ideological shift, especially in Gaza, that the people are brainwashed by Hamas before any agreement can be negotiated or talked about? Because a lot of these people just want dead Jews. They don't care as much about an extra square inch of land as they do about the entire state. Do you, do you want the short answer or the long answer? Whatever. It's the same answer. Okay. Yes. You're absolutely right. Thank you. But you never mentioned Jordan. Now, the British and the French crossed line, drew lines in the sand to create a whole bunch of fictitious countries. One of them was Jordan, or Transjordan. And well, shouldn't that fit in? Uh, why, why don't I mention Jordan? Uh, that the British drew a line, an artificial line in, in the historic land, lopped off Jordan. Uh, when, I was, uh, when I was young, I belonged to the Beitar Youth Movement, which was the right-wing Zionist movement of Jabotinsky and Begin. And uh, I used to wear on my sleeve, we had a patch on our, uni we had uniforms, we used to march, and uh, had a patch that had the map of his the historic land of Israel with Jordan. 
and we used to sing a song, both banks of the Jordan, this one and that one both belong to me. So uh, I, I grew up with, you know, Jordan. What about Jordan? Not only did we not, did we, did we not think that, that Judea and Samaria should be a Palestinian state, we didn't think Jordan should be a Palestinian state. We thought jo we should go back and conquer Jordan. So that was my upbringing. That was my, uh, my, my Zionist training. And um, I think that it is, it is a very, again, a very interesting historic question about Jordan and what if, what would have been if the British hadn't done it. They did. And today, if you speak to, I would imagine, if you spoke to Netanyahu and asked him, how do you feel about a Palestinian state in Jordan, I think he would find the idea horrifying at this point. Because the idea is that the Hashemites and, 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 and us are going together to try to wedge in and control a Palestinian state. They are our allies in controlling the the. A, a future possible terrorist state. So the notion of tampering with Jordan is something that you almost never hear anymore in Israeli discourse, even on the right. And I don't have the patch anymore, so uh, yeah, <laughs> I could sing you the song. <laughs> My question is, if there's, a pal if there's to be a Palestinian state, and given the, the corruption that we see inherent in the leadership of the Palestinian people now, uh, is it in this, I think it would be, but would it, would it not be in Israel's interest to engage in some nation building or uh, some teaching of democratic principles or whatnot? You know, nations have to create themselves. No one can create a nation for them. That's, that's the story of the Jews. That's the story of modern Israel. And um, we can't do it for them. And I hope they have it in them to do it. I have my doubts. Can you touch on how many so-called Palestinians fled in 48 and how many are there today that consider themselves the numbers? I'm interested to know the number. Well, um, the, I mean, the so-called Palestinians are, in fact, called Palestinians. And uh, the, there are about 700,000 uh, fled or were expelled in 1948. And today, the numbers are astronomical, 5 million more. And there, the, the outrage of the outrage of the Palestinian uh, refugee issue is that this is the only refugee population in the world where refugee status is inherited. It's passed down from generation to generation. In every other refugee situation, there's a statute of limitations. You come to a point where you're just not defined as a refugee. It doesn't matter if, 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 if my great-grandfather was a refugee. I'm not a refugee. But among the Palestinians, that distortion is built into to the structure of, of Palestinian identity. What was worse for us, accepting Oslo Agreement or not accepting a loan plan? Oh, uh, you're really getting us into, uh, into, into history. I don't have time to go into that. I, um, I think that uh, I, wish we, I, wish, I wish the Alon plan had, uh, uh, had been promoted. It was a plan for partitioning the land after 67. And, uh, and uh, from, from my point of view, Oslo was a, an historic mistake, but uh, we live with our mistakes as well of us, as, our, as our successes. Uh, just to speak on the statute of limitations that you were speaking about, um, having the Palestinians enter back into Israel, uh, Spain has recently been discussing opening its borders to Sephardic Jews. Who were Spain, uh, who, who were exiled from the Inquisition in uh, 1490s. Um, so what would that do for the narrative, the Jewish narrative, as far as the take on refugees? Oh, I don't think it really has, um, has, has an effect. You know, I think that one of the huge mistakes we made 
was in not promoting the story of the expulsion of Jews from Arab countries. It's, it's, that's, that's another historic mistake along with Oslo. But um, I'll, I'll just make one last comment before we, 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 con we, we conclude. And that is that the perspective that I'm trying to convey to you is on the one hand, a frank acceptance of the reality of a Palestinian people, a Palestinian narrative, and on the other hand, at the same time, a, a frank uh, acceptance of the fact that our narrative is strong enough to stand without denying the legitimacy of a counter-narrative. And I think that that is the most effective way to explain us, and I have, I've, I've been, I've been meeting with uh, groups of um, mainline Christians who are dealing with the di divestment issue. And I find that when, when one acknowledges that there is this other story, but here is my story, that's when we get heard. And that's certainly the case on campuses today. It's certainly the case in the media. And I hope that those of you who are out there defending Israel uh, will do so in a way that's credible and in a way that can be heard by, uh, by public opinion. Thank you all very much.